And he had the dubious honor of being the cross-eyed preacher. He would stand in front of fields of 20,000 to 30,000 people in the open fields of England near his hometown of Bristol. This was a a time where there were no sound systems, there were no amplifiers, there were no microphones, and he would just be a man on fire preaching his heart out to those that would want to listen to him. At the time, he was the most popular preacher in both Britain and the American colonies. He even made friends with Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin loved to hear this man preach, although Benjamin Franklin himself was never converted to Christ. God used this faithful preacher, this cross-eyed preacher, this open-air preacher, to help launch the Great Awakening both in America and in Britain. He was friends with Jonathan Edwards. Who's the man? His name, George Whitfield who 100 years later, Charles Spurgeon said, was England's greatest preacher. Now, that's a lot coming from Charles Spurgeon. And when you, when you read about Whitfield, I'm in the process of reading his biography right now, and you find out that although he was the most popular man, really the most popular preacher in England and America, he never watered down his gospel. He never watered down his message. He preached salvation by faith alone, through Christ alone. He preached the sovereignty of God. He preached hell. He preached repentance. He, he called sin, sin. And we probably haven't seen anything like George Whitfield in this America since maybe Billy Graham, a man that captivated an entire nation. What made Whitfield such a great preacher? Was it because he was so eloquent Was it because he was so passionate? Those things are important, eloquence and passion. But those do not make a great preacher. He knew that without the Holy Spirit in his ministry, he would be sunk. He knew that he desperately needed the power of the Holy Spirit in his ministry. As a matter of fact, his biographer writes this, Whitfield's effectiveness lay not in his eloquence or his zeal, We look back and realize that in raising up Whitfield, God granted upon him and his ministry a mighty effusion of the Holy Spirit. And it was this, the divine power, which was the first secret of his success. He uses the word a mighty effusion. Now, how many of you know what an effusion is? Do we use that word a lot? It means an outpouring. George Whitfield experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on his ministry and saw thousands of souls saved for the kingdom. And that's what happened last week at Pentecost. Do you remember a mighty effusion, a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit came upon them and clothed them with on power, with on high to be a witnesses for Jesus Christ to the ends of the world. And last week we saw the sound, right? What was the sound? A mighty rushing wind. We saw the sight. Tongues of fire resting upon their heads. And we saw the speech. They were all speaking in different languages. And if we looked at the significance of Pentecost, we realized that God returned his glory to the temple. We are that temple. God reversed the curse that was at Babel. And God gathered in his church and birthed this new movement of the new covenant people. But yet, this event needed to be explained. Because if you remember, some were mocking and saying, these guys are drunk. And those that were speaking in other tongues were wondering what was going on. And so Peter stands up, and what we have before us this morning is the very first Christian sermon. The first Christian sermon. And sermons, speeches if you will, are very, very important in the book of Acts. All throughout Acts, we are going to see messages or sermons or speeches by the apostles. And it does us well to see what was the content of their sermon. So whether or not you're a preacher, most of you aren't, you see a pattern or model here of how they did their preaching. And you need to understand something. We need to appreciate this message for two reasons. Here's two reasons why you need to appreciate the sermons in the the book of Acts. Number one, you listen to sermons every week, whether you like it or not. 
You come in here and you listen to me preach and you need to be able to have a diet to understand what is a biblical sermon? Why does Sean do what he does? Why does Sean have all this scripture backing up what he's talking about? Why does, why does Sean not just stand up here and give happy little facts and, and happy little stories and give you steps for living? Why does he go so in depth to the text? Why does he explain the text? Why does he call you to repentance? Why are sometimes my messages hard? Why do I do what I do? You need to be able to understand that, why I do what I do, because we see why I do what I do because I do what Peter does right here. And whether you're preaching or not, it's a blueprint for you to understand good preaching. You need to understand what good biblical solid preaching is, and you see a model of it here in the book of Acts. But none of you are probably going to be Andrew or me that stands up here and preach. Here's the second reason why you need to understand this. This is also a blueprint for your personal witnessing. Every single one of you is called to share the gospel with someone else. And what you see Peter doing here is also a blueprint for how you share the gospel with your friends, your neighbors, your family members, how you share the gospel. And one thing you will not see Peter do, it's very interesting, one thing Peter does not do in this sermon, he doesn't talk about himself. He could have elevated all the stories about him walking on water. He never talks about himself. He lifts up Jesus. Now may I remind you, Peter's the one that preaches the message we're about to see. But as we looked at last week, how many were in the upper room? There were 120 that were what? Speaking the mighty works of God in their own language. So there were 120 that were also preaching. They just weren't standing up in front of the crowd. They were sharing the gospel. But Peter never really talks about himself. And I think sometimes when we share our testimonies, we can be a bit little unbalanced. I think it's important to share our personal testimonies, but if you listen sometimes, when we share our testimonies, sometimes we can be so imbalanced that we talk all about ourselves, what we did, what happened to us, our story, that we fail to get to the most important thing, and that's who is Jesus, what has Jesus done, and his call to repentance. And so that's what we see here. We see the first Christian sermon. So whether you're a preacher like me, and this helps you understand how to preach, or whether you're just an average Christian, This helps you in your personal witnessing. What does Peter do here that we can learn in our personal sharing of the gospel? And so what we see here is that Peter's sermon has three parts. Now you know why pastors have three points in a poem. I didn't say Peter had three points. He's got many points, but he's got three parts to his sermon. So we're going to look at these three parts to Peter's sermon, but before we do that, I think it's crucial that before Peter gets up and stands up to preach, we look back at something that happened last week that I did not go into a lot of detail with. I wanted to wait until this week. So look at Acts chapter 2 verse 4. It's very crucial that this happens first before they begin speaking. Before the 120 begins speaking and sharing and witnessing, before Peter gets up and preaches, what do we find in Acts chapter 2 verse 4? And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit means there comes a point in time where the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power to be able to boldly proclaim the gospel. Has that ever happened to you? Has it ever happened to you where you were sharing Christ with someone and you just realized that the Holy Spirit was taken over? And you did not know what was coming out of your mouth. And when it was over, you stopped and you went like, whoa, that wasn't me. That must have been the Holy Spirit. At that moment, you were filled with the Holy Spirit to be able to give bold proclamation. And so that's what it means to be filled. It's a point in time. It's in the passive. You don't fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. He fills you with power to be able to boldly proclaim the gospel. And we see this all throughout the book of Acts. They're filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak. And so Peter, before he dares get up and preaches a message, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's look at these three parts of his sermon. So let's go, actually, skip down to verse 14, because this is where the sermon starts. This is where everything starts. Acts 2, 14. But Peter... Standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions and your old men dream dreams. 
Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, that great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here's movement number one. Here's part number one of Peter's sermon. It's a defense from Scripture. A defense from Scripture. Because what's going on? These naysayers are saying, these guys are drunk. We don't have no idea what they're doing. And the people that are speaking in other languages, they're confused about what's going on. And so Peter's going to stand up boldly, and he's going to give a defense from the Scripture. And he's going to say, what's happening before you right now was prophesied by Joel. It was prophesied long ago. It's coming to bear right now. I'm going to give a defense from the Old Testament scriptures. Notice what he says in verse 16. This is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. I think that the King James says this is that. This is that. What's going on right now is what Joel prophesied was going to happen. And so Peter goes on to quote Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And you probably see it in quotations there, and you probably have a notation at the bottom of footnote that he's quoting from Joel. This is what Joel said. In the last days, God's going to pour out his spirit. Now, I have a lot of people ask me, are we living in the last days? And I always say yes. And they look at me, well, how do you know? And I say, well, we're living in the last days because the last days started when Jesus went back up to heaven and the Holy Spirit was poured out. We are in the last days. Now, we're a little bit closer to the end than we were yesterday. But even the, old, even the writers of the New Testament believed that they were in the last days. So what I believe Joel is prophesying here is not something for some future day to come down the pike, but he's talking about what happened there at Pentecost, ultimately. Because you'll see some televangelists and you'll see some, some TV preachers talk about, well, there's going to be this latter outpouring, this latter rain. There's going to be this outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days where people are going to have visions and dreams and prophesy. And there's going to be this huge anointing, and maybe, I don't know. I don't think that's what Joel's talking about right here. I think Joel's talking about what happened at Pentecost is being fulfilled right before their eyes. And notice the most important thing that happens is, I will pour out my spirit on whom? All flesh. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon certain people. If you were a prophet, the Holy Spirit came upon you. If you were a priest, the Holy Spirit came upon you. If you were a king, the Holy Spirit came upon you. Average Joe, ordinary Israelite, didn't have the Holy Spirit come upon them very often. But Joel prophesies that the Holy Spirit's going to come upon all people. That's why the tongues of fire rested on each of their heads. Now the Holy Spirit's available to come live inside of all people. When you're saved, you get the Holy Spirit. We have the privilege of the promise of the Holy Spirit. And notice what he says there. It's on all genders. You've got male and female. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. It won't just be for male kings in the Old Testament. It will be for both men and women. It will be old and young. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. There's no, there's no gender, there's no age, and then there's no classification of occupation. It says, my male servants and my female servants. And so what, what Joel's saying and what Peter's interpreting is, is that when the Holy Spirit comes, it's going to be for all people. It doesn't matter if you're an Old Testament king, if you're a little boy, a little girl, an old man, an old woman. The Holy Spirit will come upon you when you trust Christ for salvation. And that's what happens here. All these diverse people from all over the known world are gathered and the Holy Spirit's been poured out upon them in that moment. And Peter's saying, what's happening right now is what Joel said was going to happen. But then he talks about wonders in the heavens above and the signs on the earth below. Signs and wonders are going to happen. Now we have to ask the question, is this a future day or did these happen during the life of Christ and at Pentecost? I believe it's both. Because he talks about these signs and wonders. He says in verse 20, Um, In verse 21, and I will show in the heavens above and signs on the earth below blood. Well, what was the blood? The blood's the cross. Jesus Christ dying on the cross. We sang about the old rugged cross, blood. What else does he say? Fire. Well, where's the fire? We looked at this last week. Tongues of fire came and rested upon their heads. Where's the vapor of smoke? Remember the whole imagery we looked at last week with with Israel coming uh, at the Mount Sinai and and God coming in the cloud of smoke representing his presence and his power? So you've got blood, fire, and smoke. Verse 20, the sun shall be turned to darkness. When did that happen? Well, in Luke 23, 44 through 45, we find these words. It was now about the sixth hour, 
And there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. When Jesus died on the cross, the sun turned to darkness. Now, when did the moon turn to blood? Historians tell us that when Jesus was sacrificed, it was Passover. And there was a full moon over Jerusalem. And that because of the darkness of the sun, it caused the moon to look like blood. Now, these events inaugurated the last days. But I do believe we will see some things happen in the very last, last days. Because the Bible speaks elsewhere of the the sun turning to darkness, the moon turning to blood, stars falling from the heavens at that great and final day of the Lord. There's going to be a future day where those things are going to happen. Revelation talks about that, that there is going to be the great and mighty day of the Lord. The Old Testament speaks of the day of the Lord being a future day of judgment. We can also look at the day of the Lord of Pentecost. I think it's a both both interpretation there. But I think what Peter's point is, is that God has come. God is going to come. There's going to be judgment. And so look at what he says at verse 21. Because things are going to happen this way, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's starting this whole salvation message. You can be saved now. Call upon the name of the Lord and you can be saved now. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. Boys, girls, men, women, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love what John Calvin comments on this verse He says, an excellent place. He just said, this is an excellent place. God pricks us forward like sluggish mules with threatenings and terrors to seek salvation so that after he's brought darkness upon the face of heaven and earth, he shows us a means of salvation that shines before our eyes. We can call upon him. What an excellent place that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so what Peter does is he gives a defense from Scripture. He says, what's going on, guys, was, was prophesied in Scripture. I'm giving a defense. I'm giving an apologetic. Now, it's important that in your personal witnessing, you're ready to give a defense. There may be some times when you're sharing the gospel that you need to overcome objections. People may have issues. They may have objections. They may have doubts. You may have to go back and show them the scriptures. You need to be ready to give a defense from the Bible of why you believe what you believe to show that the Bible is trustworthy. Now, what is Peter doing? Peter's giving a defense. This is Peter giving this defense. What does Peter write in his epistle? 1 Peter 3 15 through 16. The same Peter who preached this message told us these words in 1 Peter 3, 15 through 16. But in your hearts, regard Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that's in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Sometimes you need to be ready to give a defense, to tell those about Jesus, to be ready to give the answer. If somebody comes to you and says, why, why are you a Christian? You've got to be ready to give a defense, give an answer, give your reasons. And that's what Peter's doing here in the very first part of this message. So part one is a defense, but it's incomplete. This means nothing if he doesn't get to Jesus. And that's what happens here. He makes a beeline to Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said this in almost every sermon he preached. He would make a beeline to the cross. And that's what Peter does. So section number one of his message is a defense from Scripture. Here's section number two. It's simply a declaration of Christ. He's going to lay before us Christ and the glories of Christ. He's not going to talk about himself. He's not going to talk about his experiences. He's going to lift up Jesus. So let's see this. In verse 22, we get to the second part of Peter's sermon here. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, losing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced, my flesh 
flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he's poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For this David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Peter packs no punches. He's got four points under this big heading. What are the four points of Peter's little section here? First point, Jesus is the divine son of God, worthy of all worship. Notice what he says in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did among him in your midst. This Jesus of Nazareth is the mighty, miracle-working, sinless son of God. If you go back and you read the Gospels, every time that Jesus either teaches, preaches, or heals, how do the crowds respond? They respond by saying, this man has authority. He's not just any man from Nazareth. Yes, he was born in Bethlehem. Yes, he was a carpenter from Nazareth. Yes, he is fully God and fully man. He is the God man, the infinite God man. So point one is Jesus is God. Point two, very simple. Jesus died on the cross. Look at what he says. Verse 23, this Jesus Delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. The cross was not an afterthought in God's mind. It wasn't as if God was surprised that Jesus went to the cross. He wasn't surprised by Judas' betrayal. This was the divine, definite, predestined plan of God that Jesus would go to the cross. As a matter of fact, in the covenant of redemption, God the Father, Jesus the Son, in eternity past, covenanted together that they would set into motion a plan of salvation. God would send Jesus because he loved the world. Jesus would die on the cross because he loved sinners. And that plan was a predestined plan of God from the very beginning. And God is sovereign over this plan, but God can never be charged with doing evil. What's the most evil thing that ever happened in this world? The death of Jesus. And those men that nailed Jesus to the cross will be held accountable. What does Peter say? He was killed by the hands of lawless men. Although God predestined the cross to take place, those that killed Jesus will be held accountable. So you may ask the question, well, who killed Jesus? Some of you would say, well, Judas killed Jesus. And you'd be right. Judas set in motion the betrayal with a kiss. Well, some of you may say, well, it was the the Jewish authorities who held the kangaroo court where they brought in all these false witnesses and trumped up charges. They they killed Jesus, and you would be right. Some of you would say, well, it's Pontius Pilate. He's the one that that signed the death seal. He's the one that actually um, set the execution into place. Pontius Pilate killed Jesus, and you would be right. Some of you would say, well, no, really, it was the Roman soldiers that actually nailed uh, the, the, the spikes into his hands and feet. They're the ones who put Jesus to death. And you'd all be right. All four of those groups of people put Jesus to death, and they will be held accountable for the wickedness that they did in putting Jesus to death. But behind all that, God had a plan that it would happen. This is the first reference in the book of Acts to God's plan. He says, Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan. In Ephesians 1.11, we find that God works all things out according to the counsel of his will. God's plan will be fulfilled. So a good message focuses on the cross. If I haven't taken you to the cross of Christ, if I haven't shown you the glories of the cross, I failed you. It doesn't mean that every message I preach has to be all about the cross, but if I don't offer you Jesus as the only satisfactory substitute for your sins, as the, as the sin bearer that can forgive you, if I don't hold that out to you in a message and you don't do that in your personal witnessing, we failed people. People need to see the cross. As offensive as it is in your personal witnessing, you've got to get to the cross. Make a beeline to the cross. Talk about the cross. What did Jesus do at the cross? What happened at the cross? Don't just settle for Jesus died on the cross. Go into detail. Go into depth. What's going on at the cross? So point one, Jesus is God's son. Point two, Jesus died on the cross. Well, guess what point three is? Jesus rose from the dead. 
It's the resurrection. Notice what he says next in verse 24. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. The resurrection. If you go through the book of Acts, as we continue to go through in the next few months, the resurrection is always on their lips. They're always talking about the resurrection. They're always talking about Jesus rising from the dead. Without the empty tomb, there is no Christianity. And so they're always talking about God raised him. God raised him. Jesus is resurrected. And notice what Peter does. Peter does what all good sermons need to have. He uses scriptural support to back up his point. You may wonder, why do you have all these scriptures up here all the time, Sean? seems like your sermons are just inundated with scriptures. I do that purposely. I want you to see, number one, where where this view I'm coming from is all throughout the scriptures, and I want you to see how it fits together, and I also want you to have confidence in the scriptures. So what does he do? He begins to quote David. Psalm 16, 8 through 11, right there. In Psalm 16, 8 through 11, you see it quoted there in verses 25 through 28. Peter's basically saying David in his psalm wrote about Jesus rising from the dead. There was going to be a Messiah that would come as king and he would not see corruption. He would not go see death. He would rise from the dead. It's a messianic psalm predicting that. Now look at verse 29. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence, Parasia. That word always shows up after someone's filled with the Holy Spirit. They speak with confidence. They speak with boldness. And basically, what, Dave, what Peter's doing here is saying that David understood that God had promised him in 2 Samuel 7, the Davidic covenant, he would have an heir on the throne. David, you're going to have an everlasting heir on an everlasting throne. Now, and, and Peter says, well, you can go see David's grave today. David died and was buried. Solomon was died and was buried. Every king after David and Solomon died and were buried. How in the world is there going to be an everlasting king on the throne if somebody's died and buried? And and, and David says, there's going to come a day where I'm going to have a son who's going to die and be buried, but he's going to rise again. His name is going to be Jesus. He's the coming Messiah. Psalm 132, 11. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne so the sinless life of jesus the cross of jesus the resurrection of jesus what's his fourth point the ascension of jesus the ascension of jesus notice what he says there in verse 31 he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of christ that he was not abandoned to hades nor did his flesh see corruption this jesus god raised up and of that we are all witnesses being therefore exalted at the right hand of god and having received from the promise of the holy spirit he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. And then David goes on to, or Peter goes on to quote David again there. He quotes Psalm 110, 1 through 2. Psalm 110, 1 through 2, a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. The ascension of Christ to the right hand of the Father. Now, what's the importance of the right hand? In that culture, the right hand meant power. Jesus is ascended to the right hand of, of, Christ, of God, the Father. So what does Peter do here in his sermon? It's very clear, very concise. He starts with, Jesus is God's son. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus rose again. Jesus ascended into heaven. He's poured out the Holy Spirit, and he uses scripture to back it up. What we have here is a very clear, concise gospel presentation. But then in verse 36, you have the shocker. You have the boldest statement of all. Here's the punchline. Here's the kicker. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. He says, be certain, Israelites. Know this for sure. Let there be no doubt in your mind. Let this sink down deep into your souls that there is a Christ and you are guilty of killing him. Peter points his finger in their face and says, you're guilty. You killed this Jesus. And he is absolute Christ. And he's absolute Lord. Notice the two titles that Peter gives for Jesus. Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. He's Lord. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. What does it mean that Jesus is Lord? It means he's master, he's ruler. He has absolute rights over your life. You don't make Jesus Lord, he's already Lord. He's the king, he's the the ruler, he's the absolute monarch of your life. He is absolutely in charge of everything. He is Lord. 
You need to submit to him as Lord. But not only is he Lord, notice what else Peter says. He is Christ. That means Messiah, the anointed one. He's the promised king that's coming. Jesus is the king. He's the promised Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the Lord. He's absolutely the sinless savior. He died on the cross. He rose again. He reigns in heaven. He is absolutely Lord and Christ. And guess what, Israelites? This Christ who's absolutely Lord, you killed. You're guilty. You are guilty. You're stopped dead in your tracks, Israelites. You have to put your hand over your mouth. You can't make any excuses. You can't plead the fifth. You can't say anything because you are guilty before this king and you've rebelled. How's that for a seeker-sensitive, let's all get along, have your best life now sermon from Peter? He pulls no punches and it hurts. When you are confronted with sin, it hurts. It pains. Peter looks them squarely between the eyes with the unadulterated gospel and says, you are responsible for the death of Jesus. And by implication, we are responsible for the death of Jesus. It's convicting. It's painful. It's uncomfortable. And so now we get to the third movement of Peter's sermon. What's movement number one? A defense from Scripture. Movement number two, a declaration of Christ. Movement number three is a demand. A demand to what? A demand to repent. Let's see what else happens. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all those who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added to that day about 3,000 souls. Notice what it says about their hearts. They were cut to the heart. Their consciences were pricked. They were under strong, strong conviction. And that's what happens when the gospel shows up in power. Whether it's a preacher standing up here filled with the Holy Spirit presenting the gospel or whether it's you filled with the Holy Spirit presenting the gospel to your friend, when the Holy Spirit shows up in power and brings conviction, hearts are cut to the quick. Hearts are exposed. That's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 through 5. He says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. That's what's going on right here. The gospel's coming in power and conviction. They are overwhelmed. There is no altar call. The altar call comes from these men. They say, what do we need to do? You didn't have to browbeat him. You didn't have to sing 18 verses of just as I am and dim the lights and arm to wisdom. They're standing in line saying, we are under serious conviction of sin. What do we need to do right now to be saved? And that's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes. If the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you are one of God's chosen, he will call you out and it may be a travail of soul. It may be painful. It may be hurt, but you're coming. Because God has worked on your heart to bring you to the point of conviction. And so you may be here this morning under deep conviction because God is calling to your heart. God is working on your heart. You're being pricked in your conscience, exactly what's going on right here. And the only thing you can cry out like these men is, what can I do? What must I do? And what does Peter say? It's very simple. Repent. It's a strong command in the original language. Repent. Repent now. Repent with an urgency. Don't wait. I've said this many times. It comes from our friend Artaxerdia. The gospel is not an invitation. What's an invitation? An invitation is something you can take and throw away and say, you know what? I'm invited to a party, but I don't really think I'm going to come. You can politely decline an invitation. The gospel is a summons. What do you do with the summons? You have to obey it. To defy the Lord in Christ means to defy the Lord in Christ. And so what's the gospel call? Repent. Turn from your sin. Be grieved over your sin. 
Hate your sin. Loathe your sin. Detest your sin. Turn from that sin. Paul Washer is a hard-hitting pastor that sometimes I listen to. A lot of people can't stomach him because he's really hard-hitting. And I was listening to a message of him one time, and he says a lot of people come up to him and talk to him, and he, and he asks them, well, um, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I, I've trusted Jesus for salvation. He says, well, um, how's your relationship with God? Well, my life relationship's real good with God. God and I are just like this. And then he asks another question. Okay, you say you're a Christian. How's your relationship with your sin? And their answer is usually a little bit different. He says, if you don't loathe and despise and hate and repent of your sin, you truly haven't been converted. Repent. Repent. There's an urgency. There's an urgency of what Peter says here. Repent right now. And I would say that this morning. If you're here this morning and you've never repented of your sin, you've never turned from it, you've never detested it, you've never hated your sin, the Bible says do it right now. And then he says be baptized. And let me be careful right here because we don't want to make the mistake that some denominations do of saying that baptism equals salvation. I don't think Peter's saying here that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. What I think he's saying here is that baptism is the first act of obedience after a person has repented of their sins. That's what we believe here at Emmanuel, that baptism is a a symbol. It doesn't save you, but it comes as a first act of obedience. And so Peter mentions baptism here because it's important for following Christ. It means to be dunked. Under the water. We'll talk a little bit about that next week. It means to be dunked under the water in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And I would just say this. If you haven't been baptized by dunking, some people call it immersion. Dunking's a little bit easier to understand. Come see me after the service or make an appointment because being dunked, being baptized, is what Peter's saying is a part of following Christ. It doesn't save you. We're not saying it, it saves you. If for some reason you're not baptized, you're not going to heaven. But it's an outward symbol of what Christ has done inwardly in your life. We'll talk a little bit more about that last week, next week. But notice what he says. What's the promise? If you repent, what's the promise? Two greatest promises in all the Bible right here for you if you've repented and trusted in Christ. Notice what he says there in verse 38. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, number one, for the forgiveness of your sins, and number two, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You want to do the two greatest gifts that you can get, two greatest promises? The forgiveness of all your sins and the Holy Spirit to live in your life. And that's the promise for salvation. When you are saved, when you call upon the name of the Lord, when you repent, you receive full, total forgiveness of all your sins, past, present, and future. Your sins are wiped away, and then you get the Holy Spirit as a gift to come live inside your life to give you the power to live the Christian life. It's amazing. And this is for you. You may be thinking, well, this was just the message there for the first people that were there and those 5,000, those those 3,000 that got saved. This message isn't for me. Look at verse 39. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Who are the ones that are far off? That's us. We weren't there. We're far off. We hadn't even been thought of yet. The promise is for you. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, I'm really far off. I don't think God could save me. There may be some of you that walked into this room today and said, you know what, I've done so many wicked things in my heart and my life. If everything I was done was shown up on a screen up here, this town would run me out and I would never be welcome and I would be totally loathsome in the eyes of everyone here and God could never save me. Can I tell you the good news of the gospel? God loves to save people just like you. You cannot sin beyond God's grace. There's no one too far off from God's grace. So if you've come in here and you're thinking, you know what, I've got too much sin in my life, don't clean yourself up. Trust in Christ who can clean yourself up. He can save the worst of sinners. But notice what it says here. All those to whom our Lord God calls to himself. Could it be this morning that God is calling you? Could it be this morning that God is calling you to himself? Could it be that you're sitting in your seat this morning and you're feeling the overwhelming sense of conviction in your heart? Maybe your heart is pounding and you know that you are guilty of crucifying this Jesus. You know that you're dead in your sins. You know that you deserve hell. You know that that, that you don't deserve salvation and, and you've seen the glories of Christ. You see him as the son of God. You see him in his cross. You see him in his resurrection. You know he's ascended to the right hand of the Father and the Holy Spirit is, is convicting your heart. It could be that God is calling you to himself today. And notice what Peter does in verse 40. 
he continues to, to plead with them. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourself from this crooked generation. Now, he shows the seriousness of their sin. He's exhorting them. He's, he's continuing to bear witness. He's, he's, he's concerned for them. And this is the one point where the only time I've come across a sermon where I have to say from this pulpit, I disagree with what the ESV translation is. Now, you guys know I use the ESV because I think it's one of the better translations, but I think they didn't quite get it right here in verse 40. It does not say in the original language, save yourselves. Can we save ourselves? It's in the passive voice. It really should be translated, be saved. Be saved. Be saved from what? Well, Peter says, be saved from this crooked generation. This twisted generation. Do you realize that in every generation, every generation is a twisted generation, a crooked generation. And maybe you're hanging around friends that are crooked. You're hanging around influences that are wicked. You're amongst a generation where everything is pushing you towards rebellion against God. You're surrounding yourself with friends. You're surrounding yourself with influences. You are in an ungodly situation. You're dabbling with wicked things. You're under a pool of sin. You are surrounded by a crooked generation, and you know it. What Peter's saying is you can be saved out of that. You need to be saved. And you may say, well, Sean, saved from what? Saved from your sin. Saved from God's wrath. Saved from hell. Saved from this crooked generation. You need to be saved. If you are here this morning and you have never ever trusted in Christ Jesus, you've never repented of your sins and you are under strong conviction from the Holy Spirit, the Bible says don't wait. Don't wait for an invitation. Don't wait until tomorrow. Don't wait until the next week. Don't go home and think about it. Don't spend time playing games. The Bible says, do it right now. What are you waiting for? Because there's a promise in this scripture. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you want to be saved? Do you want all of your sins forgiven? Do you want the gift of the Holy Spirit? Do you want to be saved? If you want to be saved this morning, that's evidence that the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart. If you want to be saved. And guess what? If you want to be saved this morning, Jesus is never going to cast out anybody that comes to him for salvation. Jesus is not going to say, no, don't come to me. If you want to be saved this morning, you can be saved. You can be saved. And my prayer with you, for you is that you would be saved. And at this point of the sermon, I know Every Christian in the house is tuning me out because you're already saved. And Pastor Sean's starting to talk to the lost people, and you start looking around, who's lost around me? Don't look around. I'm not going to take for granted just because you're in this church and you've come here forever that you're saved. And if you are a Christian, I would say during this time, you better be praying like crazy that people get saved. Because God uses the prayers of, of, of people to bring about his salvation. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads this morning.